Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 215, Two Intelligent Responses to My Challenge. This episode is a follow-up to episodes 124 back in February of 2016 and episode 183 in May of 2017. It's about what I've called my challenge to Jesus is God apologists. Turns out that in the course of 2017, I missed a couple of interesting and intelligent responses to it. But again, just the history of it, I guess it was about three years ago now that I had been listening to a lot of evangelical apologists just aggressively claiming that in the New Testament, obviously, Jesus is God. Now, some people are going to hear that as just a crass travesty of Trinitarian tradition. It is that, but it's part of popular evangelical religion, and so that's why I'm concerned with it. When you just say Jesus is God, straight up, the name Jesus is a personal name. The name God, the way we use the term, is practically a personal name. It's like equivalent to one. It's understood in that way. And so you're just saying that Jesus and God are the same being and the same person. Indeed, they're just the same. They're numerically one. That's what people hear when you say that Jesus is God. Generally speaking, that's what people hear. Now, a very learned person might hear that as shorthand for all the claims of traditional Catholic orthodoxy. Yes, I know. But yeah, this is just a confusion. It's just something that any Trinitarian and any Unitarian Even somebody who doesn't even have a position on the Trinity, but who's a Christian, should deny. So one day when I was thinking about this, I think it was right after, I think it was right after watching a video presentation by Dr. David Wood, I just came up with this argument. And I said to myself, well, David Wood has a PhD in philosophy. He should understand the concept of numerical identity and a few other slightly technical things that are in this argument. I'm just going to send this to him privately and say, hey, I want to have an argument with you about this. Why do you keep saying Jesus is God? Right, but in your view, they can't be numerically one. Even insofar as you're a Trinitarian, your view can't be that the one just is the other, so that whatever is true of one has to be true of the other. So I sent it to him, and this is what I heard back. For about a solid year, And so I figured, well, he's just never going to reply. I think I followed up once more to see if he would engage in argument, but nope, not interested. And uh, yeah, after that, I did the original episode, Podcast 124, and I didn't call him out by name. I did call him out later in episode 180, but, you know, I think he's kind of enjoying being a YouTube star and really is not interested in hard thinking about deep theological and Christological subjects. He's kind of a full-time polemicist against Islam. But yeah, my wider concern is just with this confusion in popular evangelical religion, and specifically in popular evangelical apologetics. It's a confusion. It's spreading confusion. So let me briefly just run through the argument, again, to remind you what it is. Premise one is that God and Jesus differ. And it doesn't matter, in my view, whether you take God to refer to the Trinity or, as in the New Testament, you take God to refer to the Father. I still think it's going to be a sound argument either way. Okay, but with that qualification, God and Jesus differ. That's obviously true, according to anyone who believes in the New Testament. Premise two, things which differ are two. That is, they are not numerically identical. Right. A thing can't be and not be the same way at the same time. So if at any time some X and Y have differed, they must be different things. If they were the same thing, they would never differ. They could never differ if they were numerically one. So it follows, this is the preliminary conclusion, that therefore God and Jesus are two. That is to say, they're not numerically identical. Okay, now we throw in a little principle that I claim is self-evident, and a lot of philosophers accept that it is self-evident. So it's something that you should be able to understand is true just by understanding the meaning of it. It says, for any X and any Y, X and Y are the same God, only if X and Y are not two. So being the same God requires being the same. 
being numerically one. Well, being the same anything requires being numerically one, right? Being the same man, being the same potato. Okay, but if you accept that general principle, then it follows from what we've said, that therefore God and Jesus are not the same God. They're not the same God because they're not the same being, taking being in the widest possible sense, just something that can be referred to. Add another premise in. This is step six in the argument that there is only one God. I take it this is not in dispute among Christians. Good. Another conclusion follows from five and six, which is step seven. Therefore, either God is not a God or Jesus is not a God. Right? If we know that they're not the same God, and yet there's only one God, well, either one's a God or the other's a God, but they can't both be gods, because that would be two gods, given that they're not the same God. Okay? So one of them is not a God, but God, just by definition, this is premise eight, God is a God. When you use the word God with a capital G, what you're referring to is a God. If he's the one God, it follows that he is a God. To say that he's a God doesn't imply that he has peers. No, he can still be unique. If someone is your one and only son, he is a son of yours. Right. So if someone is the God, then they are a God. And that's consistent with there only being one God. Okay, so God is a God. This is presupposed by all Christians. So therefore, Jesus is not a God. That follows from step seven and from step eight. Okay, but when you say Jesus is God... You're saying that he is a God, right? You're meaning to imply that. Okay, but by this argument, he can't be a God. Interestingly, it's not an anti-Trinitarian argument. Some Trinitarians, in my view, will accept this and should accept it as a sound argument. As an example, I would give the apologist William Lane Craig. It seems to me that he would agree with every premise in this argument. As far as I know, he would agree that it is a valid argument, and so therefore he would have to agree that Jesus is not a God. I think he would say that the only God there is is the Trinity, and since Jesus is not the Trinity, therefore Jesus is not a God. Now he'll go around talking about the deity of Christ, but then he has a story and he has his own special theory about how to interpret the small c Catholic Trinitarian traditions. But I just give him as an example of somebody who, I've not talked to him about this, but I'm pretty sure that he would accept this as a sound argument. Just so, I think any biblical Unitarian like myself should accept this as a sound argument. The premises are unobjectionable. In fact, some of them are just straightforwardly required by Scripture, and the other ones seem to be just obviously true. So, boom, it looks like good reasoning. You should accept it as a sound argument. Now, to date, as far as the Jesus as God apologists themselves, they have basically all run and hid. Not a single one of them has responded to this argument. And so I just encourage you, if you hear someone just making the case that in the Bible Jesus is God, you should ask them what their response to this argument is. It's been sitting out there for two years. The premises are pretty easy to understand. And the motivation for the premises are very clear. I haven't gone through it in detail now, like I did in the original post, but I'm not just coming up with this stuff. Most of these premises are things that should be uncontroversial. So there is one evangelical apologist who has responded intelligently to this, and I've discussed this on a previous podcast and in a post or two on the Trinity's blog. That's Dr. James Anderson of Reformed Theological Seminary. And although he is an evangelical apologist and believes in the, quote, deity of Christ, he's really not a Jesus is God apologist. Now, he does say in his book, Why Should I Believe Christianity, that Jesus was, quote, claiming to be God. And that's pretty close, although it's clear that what he means to affirm is really the traditional Catholic thinking about this in all its detail. Recently on Twitter, our friend Corby Amos, who you heard in a couple podcasts recently, sent me a link to a review that James Anderson did of Nabil Qureshi's last book, which was called No God But One, Allah or Jesus. A former Muslim investigates the evidence for Islam and Christianity. He has a pretty good review of this book. I read it some time ago and pondered whether I should do a review of it on the podcast. I decided not to. It's honestly not a good book. 
in my view, the scriptural and theological reasoning is very poor. Um, it just reproduces a lot of common confusions. So I couldn't bring myself to review it. I didn't like it as much as his first book. Plus, he was in the process of dying of cancer, and that sort of took away some of my enthusiasm, too, when I was thinking about reviewing it. But anyway, Corby Amos pointed out to me that James Anderson says this in his review of Qureshi's book, quote, Another concern pertains to Qureshi's defense of the deity of Christ. The arguments he offers are unobjectionable for the most part, but he shares in the practice, common in popular evangelical apologetics, of expressing the Christian doctrine simply as, quote, Jesus is God, end quote. If that statement is taken as a loose way of affirming the full deity of Christ, the Nicene homoousios, then of course it's a true and orthodox statement. However, its imprecision can easily invite modalistic distortions of the doctrine of the Trinity, which serve to aggravate Muslim confusions rather than alleviate them. In the context of engaging Muslims, it would be safer to characterize the Christian view as, quote, Jesus is the divine Son of God, end quote, or something similar. That would still present a direct challenge to the Quran's denials while more closely tracking Christ's self descriptions and the language of the New Testament generally. End quote. So I'm happy about this, that he is publicly disavowing the simple statement that Jesus is God as confusing and misleading. Yep, he's right about that. It's just not a good shorthand for the small c Catholic tradition that, in theory, a lot of evangelicals mean to uphold. When the Trinity's podcast returns, a very learned critique of the challenge argument by a Christian philosopher. Apparently, I was very busy in 2017 because I missed a couple of interesting replies to the argument on various blogs. The first one that I'll discuss is on a blog that I haven't really read before called The Skeptical Zone, and its tagline is, I beseech you in the bowels of Christ, think it possible that you may be mistaken. And so I take it it's a skeptical and yet traditional Christian blog of some sort. The author of the post is Vijay Torley. And all I can figure out by Googling him is that he has a PhD in philosophy. I can see that he's interested in design arguments and intelligent design and evolution, and that's about all I know about the poster. So after some introductory remarks about me and my background that are accurate, Torley says this, What I'm going to argue today, however, is that the shock value of Professor Tuggy's argument, especially his conclusion that Jesus is not a god, stems from its imprecise wording, and that when its premises are reworded in a more rigorous fashion, the argument loses its sting. The modest conclusion of my reformulation of Tuggy's argument is simply that Jesus is not a divine being, and that's all. Well, sure, but a divine being means the same thing as a god, right? Unless we stipulate that we're using those words in some more specific way some way that's specific to our theorizing. So then Torley runs through the argument. It's all perfectly accurate. He understands the premises, I think, and my grounds for them. But then he starts to fuss like he kind of doesn't understand them or they bug him. On premise one, Jesus and God differ. He says, I have to say that I find this statement unacceptably vague. What on earth does it mean? In predicate calculus, one cannot say that A and B differ without specifying in advance the domain they both belong to. For instance, Tom Hanks and Arnold Schwarzenegger differ as men. Chalk and cheese differ as materials. Justice and mercy differ as virtues. Plus and minus differ as mathematical operators. So if God and Jesus differ, what do they differ as? 
The only safe answer which I think Professor Tuggy could give at this stage is that they differ as beings. Well, that's right. And by beings, I don't mean anything in particular other than something that is in some sense real and can be referred to in principle. It's not true that predicate calculus requires that we specify a domain to which things belong, if he means by that something more specific than the domain of just everything. Right, so the universal quantifier for any x, x is f, and that type of statement, or for any x, uh, if x is f, then x is g. The domain is just everything. It's unrestricted. Uh, and he brings up a technical point that I won't go into. Philosophers, you'll be familiar with this, about Hesperus and Phosphorus. He says, so what Tuggy needs to say is that God and Jesus differ in their intrinsic properties. Sure, I'll accept that as a clarification of the premise. So then Torley amends it to, one, God and Jesus are beings whose intrinsic properties differ. Now, I would say just which intrinsically differ so that we're not committed to the existence of properties. But anyway, I'm not going to object to that language. He continues, when the premise is expressed this way, though, it becomes immediately apparent that most Trinitarians would reject it, as they would never call Jesus a divine being, but a divine person. There are, however, some evangelical Trinitarians who actually do say that the terms God and Jesus are identical in meaning. It is these people that Tuggy is taking issue with in his argument. Yes, that last part's right. Those are ones I'm taking issue with. But uh, I think he's kind of missing the point in the first part of what he says. He says Trinitarians would never call Jesus a divine being. Yes, but they do think he's a being, and they think he's divine. And so, whether or not they want to use that language, they may not want to say it that way, because they're going to use the word being in a specific way to their Trinity theory. But of course, the point is just that Trinitarians should agree that God, whether we mean the Trinity or the Father by that, God and Jesus differ intrinsically. Yeah, they are committed to that that they wouldn't want to use the word being to refer to Jesus specifically. It's neither here nor there, I think, as regards this argument. Premise two, things which differ are two. He complains that we don't mention the domain to which they both belong. We don't have to mention it. It's just unrestricted domain. It's just the domain of everything. He says, one does not say that the number nine and a piece of gold are different, because that understates the vast metaphysical gulf dividing them. The former belongs to the category of numbers, while the latter belongs to the category of metals, or more generally, elements, or even raw materials. There is nothing that these categories have in common. Well, nonsense. If you think those are the right categories, you think both those categories are real. It's true that if there is such thing as the number nine, that it's different than a given piece of gold. You don't have to have in mind some big theory of categories to recognize the truth of that. If you can refer to something, and then you go on to refer to something again, just ask yourself the question, did I refer to the same thing twice? Or did I refer to one thing and then to something else? Seems to me you can answer this question without having a theory of fundamental categories other than maybe just real and unreal, or exists and doesn't exist. Okay, so he doesn't object to premise two, beings whose intrinsic properties differ are two, right? So he agrees basically with those, and so with the conclusion that God and Jesus are two beings. Now he wants to go on to discuss premise four. Again, he fusses and he wants to reformulate four to say that for any x and y, X and Y are the same divine being only if X and Y are the same being. Yes, using being as just like something that's real in some sense and that can be referred to, then that really is what I meant in my premise for. And he says, stated this way, the premise is utterly uncontroversial. Well, okay. Then he immediately adds, not utterly uncontroversial, some classical theists, so-called, he says, would object to describing God as a divine being. That's because they want to say that God is being itself. 
yeah, I'm not going to go there today. Now, even though he's being friendly to my argument, I'm going to have to <laughs> disagree with him a little bit here. He says premise four is utterly uncontroversial. It's not totally uncontroversial. I think it should be, okay, but it's not because of philosophers who accept relative identity theory. And we'll come back to that later in the podcast when we talk about the other response to my challenge argument. So there are philosophers who deny four. If you're very sophisticated, you can convince yourself that it's a good idea on some general grounds to deny four. Most philosophers disagree with that, though, so I'm going to keep going. Right From three and four, you get five, that therefore God and Jesus are not the same God. He doesn't comment on that further conclusion, so I guess he agrees with that further conclusion. So then he quotes premise six, there is only one God, and I use God there with a lowercase g. And let me just say, the reason I did that is because I'm using God as a general term that conceivably could apply to more than one being. Now, I don't think it's possible that there's more than one God, but anyway, the word God can be used as a kind term. And when you do that, it's more clear, I think, to use a lowercase g, because it doesn't look like a name and like a personal name there. When you say there's only one God, it's not like saying there's only one Mike or there's only one Dale Tuggy, which those are false, of course. When you say there's only one God, you mean there's only one divine being. That's just what it means. Okay, so here he complains, quote, this would no doubt strike many Christians as disconcerting, since what the Nicene Creed proclaims is, I believe in one God, big G, capital G. Why the small G, they would ask. Again, we can make sense of it if we rephrase it as follows. Premise six, here's his reformulation. There is only one divine being. Well, sure, unless you specify some special technical theoretical meaning for divine being, that there's one God and that there's one divine being, those mean the same thing. Step seven, another preliminary conclusion. Therefore, either God is not a God or Jesus is not a God. But right, because there's only one God and they can't be the same God. So I take it that he is agreeing that that does follow from five and six. But then we move on to another premise, the last independent premise in the argument. It says that God is a God. He says, quote, This assertion would look downright weird to most Christians. Tuggy justifies it by arguing that since God, Yahweh, is the only God, it follows that he is a God. Once again, we can render the premise less awkward by rewording it as follows. God is a divine being. This sounds a little funny to Christian ears. However, if we grant that God is the one and only being who is without limits of any kind, then we must acknowledge that God is a being who is without limits of any kind. End quote. Well, I don't much like that exposition of the concept of God that points in the direction of what I think are actually atheistic views about ultimate reality, to call God being with a capital B and say there's no limits. There's plenty of limits on God. For instance, he can't do what's wrong. He can't be ignorant of something. He can't not exist. He can't be created. Anyway, I don't have any objection to paraphrasing eight as God is a divine being. But notice that we're using divine being to just mean the same thing as God. We're not using it in a technical Trinitarian sense, or I should say one of the technical Trinitarian senses. Okay, so then it follows, therefore Jesus is not a divine being. The way I put it in my version is that Jesus is not a God. Right, that means the same thing. His comment is, premise nine, well he means the final conclusion, step nine in the argument, he says that this, quote, should raise no eyebrows. The reason why Jesus is not a divine being is that in standard Trinitarian theology, Jesus is not, quote, a being, end quote, in the first place, but rather a person within the divine being. Premise one of Tuggy's revised argument makes this mistaken assertion too when it declares that God and Jesus are beings, end quote. I think Dr. Torley may be assuming here that there just is one standard Trinitarian theology. I don't think there is. Actually, I know there isn't. Just Google Stanford Trinity and you'll see the gaggle of competing different, incompatible Trinitarian theories there. This is why I talk about Trinity theories and not about the Trinity or just Trinitarian theology as if that's some one thesis or set of theses. 
it's not, okay, but he's assuming that there is a standard one theology there, and on it, Jesus should not be called a being. Yeah, but that's neither here nor there. To use being just to be something that's real and can be referred to, Trinitarians all agree that Jesus is a being in that sense, and they agree that God is a being in that same sense. And so, because they know them to differ, they have to agree that they are not the same being, using being in that really thin sense. So, it's not a mistaken assertion, according to Trinitarians, that God and Jesus are beings in the sense in which I mean it. It's a correct assertion. It's something that they completely agree with. Now, when they go to expound that God is three hypostases and one usia, if you want to translate that as three persons in one being, okay, now it's up to them to say what they mean by the one shared being of the members of the Trinity there. On the face of it, it sounds like a universal essence, but some think it's a particular essence, and some think it's something else, even something analogous to matter. So we're off to the races there to kind of clarify just what our theology is, right? But this is all consistent with just accepting this argument as sound. At least it looks like it is. may depend on what you end up saying about the Trinity. If what you say in your Trinity theory entails that Jesus and God, again, whether by God you mean the Trinity or the Father, if your Trinity theory entails that Jesus and God are numerically identical, so that whatever way one is, the other one has to be that same way, then, yeah, your Trinity theory has got a really devastating problem of incoherence. The argument then will not be compatible with that sort of Trinity theory. Okay, but if your Trinity theory doesn't entail that Jesus and God are one and the same, like, say, the theory of William Hasker, or Richard Swinburne, or William Lane Craig, then, yeah, you can just accept this as a sound argument. So, yeah, the comments are basically friendly and fussy. I don't think they highlight any problem with the soundness of the argument. He really just sort of doesn't like the way it's put, but as far as I can tell, he agrees with it, or at least he doesn't want to object to it. Towards the end of his blog post, Torley says, Before I sign off, I'd like to comment on an anti-Trinitarian argument made in Professor Tuggy's podcast. If X is the God of Y, then X can't be Y. Right, so my point is, God of is a non-reflexive relation. Something can't be God of itself. He continues, In John 17, Jesus prays to the Father as his God, and in John 20, 17, he even calls the Father, quote, my God and your God, end quote, when speaking to Mary Magdalene. Does it follow that Jesus is not God? No. All that follows is that if the Father is the God of Jesus, then the Father can't be Jesus. But no Trinitarian would want to claim that the Father is Jesus, or if that were the case, then there would be no Trinity in the first place. What the Trinitarian would still claim, however, is that the Father is the same being as Jesus, although the Father and the Son are different persons of the one God. For Tuggy's anti-Trinitarian argument to work, he would require a stronger premise, which he has not argued for, which is, if X is the God of Y, then X can't be the same being as Y. Well, I think this kind of comes down to the same issue as before. The issue is not whether... For some X and Y, where X is the God of Y, they could be called the same being in some sense. In fact, I think there is a sense in which God and His Son can be called the same being. It's as if they're one. They're about the same business. And when he says that no Trinitarian would want to claim that the Father is Jesus, oh, I beg to differ. In fact, the very people who are confused and who call Jesus God will very often in church stand up and pray to God the Father, and then they will thank him for dying for us. And so they are thinking that Jesus is the Father, not to mention oneness people, leave them off to one side. Definitely some Trinitarians think that the Father and Jesus are the same self and really just the same. He says there would be no Trinity in the first place. Well, it depends. The Trinity for you is just that there are three somethings in God that could still be true, even if what I just said is true, that the Father, in some sense, just is Jesus, or they're both modes of the same self, etc. I'll come back later in the podcast to this 
claim of mine that if x is the god of y, then x can't be, that is, numerically the same as y. I think it's true, and it relates to what I think is the most controversial premise in my challenge argument. When the Trendies podcast returns, a more aggressive but less sure-footed response to the argument by a philosophically trained apologist. next response is from a blog called Beginning of Wisdom. The tagline is Apologetics in the Sight of God. And the post is by a guy named Drew Schumacher, who says that he has an undergraduate degree in philosophy, and I believe that. He made this post on November 8th, 2017. It's called Dale Tuggy's Challenge. First thing he does is he mentions the one long response that I had to the argument early on, which was from Dr. James Anderson. He says, in part, If you read Anderson's response, you find that all it does is show a way in which you could very reasonably reject one of Tuggy's premises, thus making the argument possibly unsound on the grounds of its having a false premise. That's right, he didn't actually argue that premise 4 is false, but he gave an example having to do with material constitution that he thought would cast some doubt on premise 4. If you don't believe in relative identity theory like I don't, then you're going to be wholly unmoved by his example, I think. Schumacher complains a little bit here that I didn't say more than that. Actually, as I'll explain, I'm perfectly happy if, in response to my argument, Trinitarians run in the direction of relative identity theory, because then I think I've got them on New Testament grounds. So then Schumacher goes through the argument, and he just quotes it, and he grants that it's valid. I agree, right? And remember that valid just means that There's no mistake in the reasoning, so that if you were to accept each of the independent premises, then you would be committed to the final conclusion. That's what it means to say that an argument is valid. Of course, it's a further question whether or not the premises are all true. And here is where he's going to get off the boat. Premise one, God and Jesus differ. He says this is a fairly straightforward statement, except that Tuggy doesn't define or identify who he's referring to by God and Jesus. Well, yes, as he goes on to say, it's obvious who Jesus refers to. It's that man who was crucified and then raised from the dead, of course. Really, his point is about the word God. He says God could refer to any of the following on Trinitarian theology, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, or the triune deity consisting of all three. Yes, that's right. And in a follow-up post, which I assume he didn't read, I say you can take the word God in this argument to refer to the Father or to the Trinity, and I think it'll come out sound either way. So he thinks I'm equivocating by using the term God. Yes, I'm allowing the word to have two meanings so that the argument can be accepted by Trinitarians who want to use the word God to refer to the Trinity. That's not how I use the word God, but that is one popular usage. So it's equivocation, but it's not fallacious equivocation, I don't think. Premise two, he says, is essentially a statement of the indiscernibility of identicals, that any difference between A and B proves that A is not B. That's right. So he doesn't really object to premise two. Step three just is the conclusion of one and two, so he realizes that it wouldn't make any sense to only object to three, because it's been proven once you grant one and two. Then he says this, In premise four, we come to the first major problem. No Trinitarian that Tuggy typically critiques would accept 4. So again, just to review, 4 says, For any X and any Y, X and Y are the same God, only if X and Y are not 2. That is to say, that they are numerically identical. He says, In premise 4, we come to the first major problem. No Trinitarian that Tuggy typically critiques would accept 4. Well, no, sir, that's not true. As a matter of fact, all the Trinitarians 
who have a philosophically articulated Trinity theory who do not accept relative identity theory, they would all agree with four. It's just a specific case of a more general principle, which is that if any X and Y are the same F, that's just to say that X is an F, that Y is an F, and X just is Y and vice versa. In other words, X and Y are identical. So to apply that for things to be the same God requires that the first thing is a God, the second thing is a God, oh, and the first thing just is the second thing, and vice versa. We're really just talking about one thing. Yeah, that's arguably self-evident, and that's why most philosophers would agree with it, and most Trinitarians who have studied philosophy would agree with it. Those who aren't able to grasp the mean of four because they haven't studied logic or philosophy, well, that's another thing. Not clear to me that they would straight up deny it, though. So he's quite mistaken that no Trinitarian that I typically critique would accept four. As I said at the beginning, I think that William Lane Craig would accept it. Maybe he's not typical of Trinitarians. He continues, Now I know he is fond of speaking about the topic of the Trinity as if there were hundreds of different definitions of the Trinity, and it's arrogant of anyone to say that theirs is the Trinity. This is a parlor game to poison the well against his opponent. I've heard him quote modalists as if they were Trinitarians. Since their Trinity is different, we shouldn't assume there is only one definition. It's all just a red herring to distract from any critiques of his argument. He artificially gifts himself these objections and then doesn't get around to dealing with the critique. Well, hundreds of Trinity theories? No. You can see how I choose to sort them in my Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy article on the Trinity. I group them into one-self theories, three-self theories, and then mysterians. And I make some divisions within those top-level divisions. And a mysterian, depending on quite what they're saying, they could also be a one-self theorist or a three-self theorist. It just depends kind of where they locate the mystery, how much mystery they think there is, and so on. So people mix that in with the others. But, I mean, generally the one-self theories are straight up incompatible with the three self theories and vice versa. So that's why they're different theories. And if you look at different theories within a category, say Richard Swinburne versus the theory of my friend Chad McIntosh, I mean, they're not compatible either. So yeah, they're, I don't know, I haven't counted how many Trinity theories are sort of currently in play. Sometimes you run into somebody who's a young theologian slash apologist, and they seem to have their very own Trinity theory. Bill Craig definitely has his own Trinity theory. I've never seen anything really very much like that before anywhere from anybody. So is this poisoning the well? No, it's just distinguishing between the Trinitarian lingo, the required terminology, and the interpretations thereof. And there are many interpretations. I wouldn't say there are hundreds of them, but there's definitely more than 10 floating around if you want to sort them in a fairly fine-grained way. The only reason it matters is that if you're defending the Trinity as the correct Christian theology or as the correct way to understand the Bible, I'm going to first have to ask you which theory you have in mind, because there's quite a lot of variation in this group, and arguments that I would deploy against one I would not deploy against others. New Testament passages that would pose a big problem for one would not at all pose a problem for others. So it's not a parlor game. That's just a low blow. He continues, so to get to the point of his argument, the reason I say that no Trinitarian would accept four is that, as shown in premises one through three, Trinitarians accept reference for the word God other than Jesus. Oh, wow. Okay. So the word God can be applied to beings other than Jesus. Well, sure. What does that have to do with four? Which says for any X and any Y, X and Y are the same God only if X and Y are not two. That is to say, only if they are numerically identical. A way to paraphrase four is that the same God relation forces identity. That'd be one way to put it. That is... The same God relation forces numerical identity. This is not a point about the use of the word God. He seems to be confusing points about the word God with the issue of saying that some X and Y are the same God. 
Let's see if he makes his concern clearer in how he continues. He says, Trinitarians take it that Jesus and the Father are two in some ways and one in other ways. Yes, they're supposed to be equally divine. Both have the divine essence, however that's understood. But they're supposed to be two different persons. And hopefully only one of them has died if your Trinity theory is going to fit the New Testament. He continues, We've already said how Jesus is distinct from the Father, but the way they are one is that they are one kind of thing. They are both God in nature. This is just like how Tuggy and I are both human in nature. Now, since we believe with the scriptures that there is only one God, we take Jesus and the Father to share not only the same nature, but the same being. Tuggy may not like that explanation, but he cannot just insist what premise 4 asserts. To say that if X and Y differ, then they can be the same God, only if they are not two in any way, is to beg the question against the Trinity in this premise. Trinitarian theology holds that God is a single being shared by three persons. Tuggy knows this. Trinitarian theology also typically holds that it is right and proper to call any of the three persons God as well. This does not commit the Trinitarian to claiming numerical identity between any of the persons or between any of the persons and the whole being. In fact, Trinitarians typically deny such numerical identity as being opposed to the Trinity doctrine. Let's look at premise four again. Four, for any X and Y, X and Y are the same God only if X and Y are not two, that is, they are numerically identical. No Trinitarian who understands the issues at all would affirm this statement. One must assume a Unitarian God to make this a true statement. This is why this premise begs the question. It only works if we assume the Trinity is false at the outset by accepting this premise. And again, Tuggy cannot fall back on his claim that his challenge is not an anti-Trinitarian argument when its conclusion is the denial of an essential aspect of the Trinity. The premises that follow all depend on this question-begging premise, so there isn't much more to address about the challenge itself. I don't think he realizes quite how much he's committing to in this part. He's in fact disagreeing with quite a number of very learned and brilliant philosophical Trinitarians like Hasker and Swinburne and Craig. What he's saying is that the Trinity most definitely and obviously commits one to relative identity theory. This is the theory that things can be the same something while being different something else's. It's the theory that an X and Y can be the same F and different G's, is one way to put it. Now, the first point he makes here is one that's common to a lot of contemporary evangelical apologetics, and you find this point being emphasized, for instance, in the work of William Lane Craig. He says both the Father and the Son are God in nature, and that's just like Tuggy and I are both human in nature. So then he's saying that as part of the Trinity, that they are qualitatively equal in their nature or essence, in that they're both divine. Yes, that is going to be part of any Trinity theory, although there'll be differences in how divinity is understood. But then he makes the further claim that they are the same being. Now, not all Trinitarians will agree with this. And the reason is because a lot of Trinitarians think relative identity theory is incoherent. So what if I told you that Peter and Paul were different apostles, but they were the same man? Oh, that seems impossible, right? They're different apostles. They can't be the same man. What if I tell you that Sonny and Rover are the same dog, but they're different pets? Well, no, nothing can be the same dog and different pets. If they're the same dog, they're identical. One and the same thing can't be two different pets. I mean, that's just nonsense, right? Now, it could have one owner, yeah, and then get transferred to another owner. Yeah, but we're talking about at one time, okay? So the thing about relative identity theory, and this supposes that there can be a kind of numerical sameness where things are counted as one, and yet they're not identical. The problem with this is no one has ever given an uncontroversial or at all really compelling example wherein things are the same F but different G's, or where things are numerically one but not identical. This idea of numerical sameness without identity is very controversial. The people that have defended it maybe the best in this context would be Michael Ray and Jeffrey Brower, 
in their constitution, Trinitarianism, they use an analogy to material objects, same kind of analogy that James Anderson gestured at, where things can be different form matter compounds and yet the same material object. But yeah, this is very controversial among metaphysicians. And even if you accepted that in the realm of the metaphysics of material objects, it's not clear that you should therefore accept it in the realm of the Trinity, because the Trinity is not supposed to be a material object, right? So there couldn't be material constitution going on there. Relative identity theory was begun by a Roman Catholic logician named Peter Geech, and really he began it just because of the Trinity. He thought that this was going to help the Trinity come out coherent so that it's not demonstrably incoherent. And Peter van Inwagen has moved heaven and earth to kind of try to formally show this. But yeah, at the end of the day, most people who understand these issues don't accept that it's coherent to talk about numerical sameness without identity or about things being one something and simultaneously two different something else's. So yeah, when he's saying that, he's ruling out most Trinity theories. He's saying something that most philosophers hold to be incoherent and poorly motivated, and this is all in the name of the Trinity doctrine. I'm kind of disappointed that he goes for the old James White low blow that I must be assuming a Unitarian God. I mean, this is just such a lazy charge. It gets thrown all the time, even when it's really not relevant. There's no assuming Unitarianism in this principle for as evidenced by the brilliant Trinitarian philosophers who accept four. Because again, it's just a specific instance of what seems to be a true general principle. To be the same something implies being the same. That is to say, numerically the same thing. So is the premise begging the question? Well, you know, begging the question is relative to an opponent I guess if I was mounting an argument against relative identity theory, Trinitarianism, the kind offered by Geech or Peter van Inwagen or by Brouwer and Ray in their constitution theory, if that's what was up for discussion, then yeah, in that context, it would be question begging to just assert for. Um, but it's not question begging in this context. For would be something that most Christian philosophers, I think, would agree with. Perhaps the most obvious way to get around four is to do what Craig does, to say, no, uh, the Father and Son aren't the same God at all. God's the Trinity. The Father's not the Trinity. The Son's not the Trinity. If they were to be the same God, they'd have to be identical. That's right. But they're not. So yeah, I think this critique by Drew Schumacher is good in that it understands the argument. I think it's also right in that he puts his finger on really the only premise that a serious thinking Christian could conceivably deny, but I don't think he realizes the high price of that denial. Toward the end of the post, he says, The last thing I will say about this challenge is to address why such a fallacious argument was presented in the way it was. Well, simmer down now, son. You agreed that it was a valid argument, so it's not logically fallacious, right? You think it's unsound because it has a false premise. Anyway, he continues, Tuggy said that it is a challenge to Jesus is God apologists. He said it's not against the Trinity, but against people who just say Jesus is God. As we've seen, the argument certainly does not actually touch the Trinity because it begs the question against a Trinitarian understanding of God. So who is this argument actually aimed at? I think it is interesting that no examples are given of who he thinks this argument refutes. Who specifically are these apologists he is challenging? Certainly no apologist defending an orthodox understanding of the Trinity. One might suggest he's arguing against a modalistic or oneness view, but they would just deny the first premise as being question-begging against their position. Tuggy says that he sent this to a famous apologist and didn't get an answer, but he doesn't say who. Well, actually I did say in the second episode, but I guess you only heard episode 124. Could it be that if he said who he was challenging and cited the example of Jesus' God talk given by that person as what he is attempting to refute, that one could easily find where that apologist explained more fully their view so as to render this argument null with respect to that apologist? For the life of me, I can't put anyone into that category of non-Trinitarian, non-oneness, Jesus' God apologist that would find this argument troubling. 
well, who are these Jesus has got apologists that I had in mind? Well, I already said David Wood. Who else aggressively asserts that Jesus is God and doesn't clarify? Well, I could name a lot of people, and I will in a minute, but what I just explained is that the defense that he just offered requires relative identity theory. I have never seen any evangelical apologist affirm relative identity theory in the context of defending the Trinity, unless you count the two Christian philosophers, Brower and Ray. They go to the wall, they give an articulated Trinity theory in terms of constitution relations. They say that the one divine nature is analogous to a stuff, like the stuff in a form matter compound, which is a material object. And they suggest that the Trinity involves one, something like a stuff, the divine nature in that sense, constituting simultaneously different persons because it simultaneously uh, is combined with three different forms, one form particular for each of the three divine persons. They say way more. They go way farther out on a limb than any apologist, especially any apologist who's not a philosopher that I've ever seen. So who do I have in mind who says that the New Testament says that Jesus is God? Well, David Wood, his unsavory friend Sam Shamoon, the late Nabil Qureshi, Dr. Robert M. Bowman, J. Warner Wallace, Greg Kokel. Those are several just off the top of my head. If I really sat down and did some Google searching, I could probably come up with six or 12 more of them. Right, but I'm not saying that they're actually quasi-oneness or modalists. There are some Trinitarians, maybe, who would fit uh, that description of being sort of hidden modalist, but it depends what we mean by modalist, I suppose. So yeah, it's not an argument against nobody or against just some very obscure people. It's an argument against a whole broad class of confused and confusing apologists within evangelicalism. It's just not right to try to boil Trinitarian tradition down to the claim that Jesus is God. That's at best very misleading. Whatever the Trinitarian needs to say, they can say without saying that, really. When the Trinity's podcast returns, why I'm pleased if thinking Christians respond to this argument by denying premise four. So part of what makes it difficult to have a nice argument about the Trinity is that it's very easy for people to jump around between different interpretations of the traditional Catholic language. Three hypostases and one usia can mean a bunch of different things. Does it mean something apparently contradictory, or does it appear to be consistent? Are these claims that we can barely conceive? Is it the same thing almost as saying that God is three in one way and one in a different way? Is that all it amounts to? Is God like literally a loving community or are these three streams in the life of God? There's quite a lot of room to maneuver in there. And whenever somebody brings up a problem for one interpretation, you can just kind of shift to another interpretation and claim that you've won. It's kind of frustrating. So what I like about the argument is that if you accept it as sound, which I think any Christian should, then it forces you to clarify your language now, what James Anderson almost does, but thinks the better of, is to just deny premise four. He doesn't do that. He says, well, what if a person thought four was false for this reason? Right, But he's not saying it's false for that reason. <laughs> um, Drew Schumacher throws caution to the wind and just says, no way, any Trinitarian is committed to the falsity of four. Okay, if you're committed to the falsity of four, you've just committed to the theory of relative identity. And then now, I think I've really got you in a scriptural bind. If you're saying that the Father and Son are different persons, and yet the same being, the problem is that the New Testament says that the Father is the God of Jesus, 
And this is not a fluke. It's explicitly stated seven times that the Father is Jesus as God. This is in Romans 15, 16, 2 Corinthians 1, 3, 2 Corinthians 11, 31, Ephesians 1, 3, and Ephesians 1, 17, and Ephesians 3, 13, and 1 Peter 1, 3. Add to those seven explicit statements that Jesus is quoted, or rather presented, as calling the Father, quote, my God, seven times. Mark 15, 34, Matthew 27, 46, John 20, 17, and then four times within Revelation 3, 12. Okay, so there are 14 occurrences where either Jesus says the Father is his God or someone else says that the Father is Jesus' his God. And this is by between five and seven authors. So this is just part of New Testament theology. It's not even a quirk of one writer. Okay, and here's the problem. God of is a non-reflexive relation. If X is the God of Y, then X and Y cannot be the same God. Even if you're a relative identity theorist who denies that there is such a relation as what some call strict or absolute numerical identity or Leibnizian identity, even if you think there are only relative identity relations, you can only talk about same God, same man, same animal, same planet, things like that, still the point holds. You can't have one and the same God being God over himself. So by saying that they're the same God, I take it that relative identity theory Trinitarianism of any sort is just straight up contradicting the New Testament. I think the point is almost as obvious as the point that, say, bigger than is transitive. So if you had some theological theory that said that A could be bigger than B and B could be bigger than C and yet A fails to be bigger than C, well, that's just nonsense. I mean, that's a problem if your theory implies that, because we all know that bigger than is transitive in that way. Again, if A is bigger than B, B is bigger than C, that clearly implies that A is bigger than C, right? Or take the relation exact similarity, that two things are qualitatively the same or indistinguishable. It's obvious that that is a symmetrical relation. If A is exactly similar to B, then B is exactly similar to A, right? If you've got a theological theory that denies the symmetry of exact similarity, your theory's wrong. Now, some relations, like bigger than, can't be reflexive, right? Exact similarity can be reflexive. Something can be, in fact, everything is exactly similar to itself, right? There can be similarity between two different things, but also a thing is going to automatically be exactly similar to itself. So a thing can stand in that relation to itself or to another. Okay, but God of, one and the same God, can't be God of himself. That makes no sense. Insofar as we understand the God of relation, we all know this to be true. So again, relative identity Trinitarian theories say that the Father and the Son are different persons, but they're the same God. Oh, and by the way, the Father is the God over the Son. But that's one and the same God being God of himself, which is nonsense. So I think it's productive if people run in the direction of relative identity theory. They've been running, in my opinion, in the direction of social trinity theories for too long, or what I call three self theories. Well, those contradict the New Testament too, but in a different way. But yeah, let them run for relative identity trinity theories because it just smacks right up against explicit and clear claims of the New Testament writers. Okay, well, this is how we reduce the options. This is how we knock down some of the contenders for a correct Christian theology. You test these things by their fit with Scripture. At least, if you're a Protestant, this is how you do it. This week's thinking music has been the track Little Tomcat instrumental version by Josh Woodward. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode where you can listen to or download that entire track and where you can hear the version with lyrics as well. You can also check out Josh Woodward, W-A-R-D dot com. We got a new rating and review in the iTunes store for Canada. 
user named Canalto9 gives us five stars. Their subject line is my latest favorite. They say, Trinities draws living authors into deep, nuanced explorations of the ideas in their books. The historical podcasts present a wonderful view of the depths of our Christian tradition. Excellent. Thank you so much. We always appreciate reviews in the iTunes store. It does help some people to find the podcast. And I'll tell you that there are more interviews brewing, so stay tuned for those in the coming months. For listening, we'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind. <laughs>